It's always difficult to preach when you believe that somebody else can do it better, and I'm thinking Gina could have done it better today, is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking she should have just stayed up here, kept going. I don't know about you guys, and sometimes I just want to talk out of my own mind and heart, you know, and just, you got these little programs here they put together and all these little things that you're supposed to do. I like when somebody gets up here and has something to say. I like when somebody speaks out of their spirit. I like when worshipers really worship instead of telling you to worship while they're thinking about how they can't pay their bills. I like preachers who have something to preach and something to say because they've been with Jesus. I was telling someone the other day, I said, you know, it's a difference between when you speak out of your own experience and when you're just passing out pamphlets somebody else wrote. Sometimes when we're talking about God and talking about you, we're passing out pamphlets. This is what I'm supposed to say. This is what's good for you to hear, but we're not quite sure if we ourselves have got it. What is man? Jason, go sing in my sermon here. What is man is what we've been talking about for week after week after week. I got a feeling you've been listening. Extraordinary scripture I didn't have planned, so I'm not going to act like I did, but I'm going to steal it. An extraordinary scripture, which I am going to steal. What is man that you are mindful of him? That's Psalms 8 later on when you go to study. The son of man that you care for him. For you made him a little lower. It says in the King James and the angels, go look it up. They panicked. They did. They couldn't write back when they were translating what it really says. Because if you go back and look in the actual Hebrew, it says a little lower than God. Elohim is what it actually says. So they put angels. Because back in those days, they couldn't even comprehend who we really were. And there are times, so if you get more advanced translations, by the way, this NIV says heavenly beings. A little closer to what I think it is. You made him a little lower than God. Why? Because we're the children of God. We are God's children and crowned him with glory and with honor. And you made him ruler over the works of your hands and you put everything under his Brand new boots. Wonderful, lofty, incredible, churchy stuff to read. And then you go and you look at yourself in the mirror, so to speak. You analyze your own life, your mind, your conduct, all of these things, and you say, that cannot possibly be me. And I'm here to tell you that... I don't know if I really grasp, you know, when you, when you have kids or when you, you do something that's about other people, when you do a ministry, even if you don't have your own children and you're working with that, there's something about that that teaches you the love of God, that teaches you that no matter what you see in people, there's something about them that allows you to see the God in them. You, you, it's not like they all have to be just right and just perfect. And sometimes we say that. You don't have to be perfect. We say that in church to make us all feel better. I think we should pretty much figure it out by now. That's almost a cop-out. Of course we don't have to be perfect. Jesus was perfect. I think it goes beyond that. You don't even have to be all that good. You don't have to be terribly smart. You don't have to be really all that productive to inherit a position in God's heart. Now you have to be obedient. You have to apply what you hear. You have to to, to, to do and sow what you want to reap. All these things are true when you want to download 
the blessings of that inheritance, the potential of that inheritance. But don't mistake how much God loves you with how much you do or don't do. What is man? Now, so David, now you got to understand who's writing this, right? This is David. This is the kid who was the last in line of all the kids. All kinds of stuff can come from that. It's like almost your parents, by the time you're that, you got that many kids, they almost lose you. So David's out taking care of sheep, and he's taking on bears and lions and all this stuff. He is tasted of the heavenly things. He's tasted of the power of God. And then he's looking at Bathsheba. One minute he's taking on Philistines and tearing them up. Next minute he's running like a cut from Saul. And that's why one day he just stops in the woods and just goes, you know, <laughs> I don't get it. I just don't get it sometimes. He's remembering, like, how in the world did I take on that bear? How? Like, what came over me? And then I'm running from Saul. I was so afraid I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. He says, how in the world could I have a man killed to take his wife? And then build God's temple. What are we? Lord, what is man? What are we that you are so mindful of us? What are we that we could touch the heavens and experience things that are so extraordinary? From building the span across the waters in San Francisco and calling it a bridge to entering into space and exploring in telescopes that go way beyond our best rockets and are waiting for us there, to praying for a child who's got a fever and it goes, to talking to a co-worker and their disheveled life comes in order because they accept Jesus. What is man that the next moment we can be so flawed and so weak? I've been trying to tell you over the last few weeks we are kingdom's kids. We are his boys and his girls, his young men and his young women. We are his children. And the Bible says that Jesus is what's called the firstborn of many brethren. We have been, in essence, born again into the family of God, adopted, if you like that term. In either case, we deserve none of this. It's given to us, offered to us. You think God did not anticipate your foolishness after you got saved? You think he didn't know you were going to screw up again? You think God is shocked when you sin? God isn't shocked by anything you will ever do, and he already accepted you. One of the digs that we get as Christians who believe in the way we believe is that we are way too soft. We are way too soft on sin. We are way too easy upon people. I mean, we just basically just waltz right into heaven, no matter what you do, no matter how bad you are. But in our church, bless God, we believe in holiness. It's a good word from Mike, Pastor Mike, as he tried to convey, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, let's redefine some of that mess. Because none of us would measure up. I was created in the image and likeness of God. Your great-grandfather is a primate or primordial slime. Maybe it goes back to great-great-great-great-great-great. That's up to you. Some people act as if their ancestry are animals. Some people act as if they came from chemistry. Dysfunctional, volatile chemistry. And it amazes me how the intelligentsia of our society try to argue that they are nothing. This great argument from those 
who pay $75,000 a year to be educated to try to convince everyone else that they are nothing. When a Christian go to Gateway two years, come out talking about Jesus. I'm a child of God. I know who I am. Made in the image and in the likeness of Almighty God. That's why you have the capacity to love. Love. Where does it come from? How do you evolve love from a pond of chemistry? Love, the intellect of man, the brilliance, the capacity to kill, to build, to forgive. We are not robots, we are created. And in the brilliance of God, he gave us the riskiness of free choice. Love is always risky. If you are afraid to love because you've been hurt, you're dying. Love is always risky, and so it always reattempts to trust. And so it is with God. And in this magnificent experiment called man, in the expansion of the family of God upon the earth, I'm sure God has had many, many moments where his heart has been troubled and pained by the evil and the disobedience of man, and yet I believe God is also filled with the joy of watching his children in China, in South Africa, in Haiti, in America, everywhere around the world, who are called by his name. We are the family of God. Amen. So in the last two weeks, having tried to convey that in pieces, I wanted to come to helping you and helping us understand where we stand in God, because in this generic concept of the beautiful family of God, because those who are kind of new age and those who are, who are atheists and all that, they like to talk about well, not atheists, really, but more New Age people and some other religions like to talk more about the g generic concept that we're all the children of God, and there is some truth to that. But we are talking about the intimacy of family, not just title. And in the intimacy of family, I want to identify, and the Bible is very clear in helping us to identify the very levels that we have chosen to accept in our relationship with God. Everyone in this room has chosen to accept a level in God. Now, the way I see God is he has chosen to be limitless on my behalf. So much so that the whole mess of sacrificing animals to wipe away our sin was ultimately simply not enough almost ridiculous, to the point where God went all the way, gave us everything, his son Jesus dies for us, and we are now engaging in the limitless possibilities of a relationship with God. I am telling you this is true, because right in this room, every one of these categories exists. And there are some times that we overlap from one to the other, I will admit that. But you can go as far as you want in your walk with God as you want. Please know that. Don't forget I said that. You can go as far in God as you want. It won't happen on your timetable, maybe. It won't happen always the way you want it to be. You don't get to snap your fingers and command God to do anything. He will do it his way and his time, but he will look at one thing, and that's the desire of your heart. Where is your desire? The Bible says when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And so all of a sudden now, when I delight my... In other words, I enjoy the thought of God more than I enjoy the thought of a thing. He will shift and give me new desires. And that then starts feeding into new delights. And it starts feeding into a positive thing in our lives. The Bible here, I believe, conveys seven distinct levels in him. 
You may find nine, you may, may disagree in this five, it really doesn't matter. Let me convey these to you as best I can. And the first one is found in Matthew chapter 9. I'll throw the scriptures out there, but certainly you can go look them up later. I'm not going to read all of them, obviously. If you follow the teaching over the years, you'll know we do give a lot of scripture in this church. But a lot of it is also for you to go home and for study, for your personal enjoyment. Verse 9, chapter 9, Jesus went to the house of Matthew, sitting in a tax collector's booth. When he saw a man named Matthew, not to his house, but to his booth. Follow me, he told him. Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner, it's amazing how some sinners can follow Jesus quicker and better. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him. I love this scripture. I really do. I love this scripture. So Matthew has an encounter with Jesus. What's the first thing he does? He invites Jesus over to his house. If the party was already in place, then he invites Jesus into his house. He doesn't segregate his life to the Jesus life and the personal life. Now, it might even be better if he didn't plan it. If he found Jesus, called all his friends, and invited them to come to a party. Either way, I'm impressed. Right? How many times we can go years and years on our job, and no one knows we're really... Now, if we stumble onto the subject one day, and I'm forced to, I'm not going to deny I know him. But folks, there are other levels. Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners. On hearing this, and they, because the Pharisees saw this, of course, religious-minded people, they asked the disciples. Notice they didn't have the guts to ask Jesus. They're going to go to the staff. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus, who can speak for himself, says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor. What he really wanted to say is, not those who think they're so healthy. Not so blinded by their religious sense of what healthy is, but the sick. But go and learn what this means, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but to come to call the sinners. First Timothy, he says in chapter 3 that he came to save sinners. Romans 3.23 says, all have what? Sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what I'm supposed to do as a preacher now is say, how many here have sinned? And you all go, how many still sin? Because uh, you don't want your wife to know. But I'm not going to do all that. So what I'm going to do is say, I don't think it takes genius, nor do I need 45 minutes to develop the fact that we all have sinned and we all continue to sin, but let me just give you the thing you got to take with you. You may continue to sin, but if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, you are no longer a sinner. Behavior and identity are two different things. Have you ever said something, you can't believe you said it, but it really wasn't you? Well, maybe it was a little part of you, but it really wasn't the dominant part of you. And sometimes when we sin, the word sin, by the way, simply means to miss the mark of God's ideal, whatever he has in mind. You can actually sin by not having faith. We don't have to go out and do a bad thing to sin. So, we often struggle. When you have fear in your life, you are sinning, but that doesn't make you a sinner. You are a sinner when you don't have Christ in you. Why? Because when you have Jesus Christ in you, when the Father looks down upon you, he sees Jesus in terms of legal matters, in terms of identity. He sees Jesus in you, which makes you a part of the family. 
He still does not like us to sin. He sees it as a distraction, if not a hindrance to what he can do on our behalf that changes nothing in terms of our identity and our divine relationship. Oh my God, if you get that right there, you stop moaning and groaning about how I'm just such a loser. I'm just such a... You may be a loser, but you're not saved. You can't be saved and be a loser. You can be saved and continue to lose. But you can't be born again, child of the living God, and be a loser. And that is the message to the world they need to hear. Amen? So number one there. Number two, he moves us on and hopefully we grasp that in Christ, having, you see, because when you first accept Jesus and then you sin, it freaks you out. Like for two days. <laughs> After you're used to it. But it freaks you out. Because in your mind, okay, maybe you got saved in an altar, tears, laying out of hands, prayer, all that, parking lot, wherever it is, you can accept Jesus wherever you are, right? You can go online, the preacher will lead you to Christ. You can be in a movie and accept Jesus Christ in a movie for whatever reason, and then, but there is something about the, the tense you get, and you're praying with the preacher, you have that moment, and you just kind of, you just kind of float home, you know? Everything feels light, it feels better, you feel good, and you just got this little window of born againness. I, I made that up. The <laughs> thing about that is that we want to warn you and say, please, but we don't want to ruin the moment. We don't want to cut it short. We want you to get every hour and every day you can out of that wonderful honeymoon like, I just met Jesus feeling. But we want to tell you, you're going to screw up <laughs> before the cock crows. Is coming. I remember the first time one of my daughters, first time ever, saw some old boy out there under that awning of their smoke and lit up a cigarette to come into church. Now, we've instructed our ushers to shoot them on sight, but <laughs> for whatever reason, they didn't do it. She's a little girl, just a little thing. She just saw that she freaked out. I mean, she couldn't, she could not imagine that a Christian would smoke. I can't either. We cried for two days together, but <laughs> the truth of the matter was, you see what I'm saying? You realize very quickly, man, this isn't about all that mess that we, this isn't about all imperfect, holy Christians going in. This is about, man, if it wasn't for Jesus. This is about, we're in this thing together. This is about an ark that smells. <laughs> Poop everywhere. Y'all gonna take it out? That's the ark. Talk about your own little religious ark. My ark's filled with poop. <laughs> Folks, I'm sorry. Real is better. And so when I go jumping from this thing of, oh, my God, and now I feel loved and I feel whatever, and then we're, we're kind of vulnerable. Now we move into the next. We are now sheep. I know you could argue with all this, but I'm just telling you, sheep are an interesting category. John 10, if you're there, if you're not there, it's because you're slow. <laughs> I'll wait for you. John 10. Basically, he wants us to know that ultimately, regardless of who is on staff at your church, he is your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Everybody say, the Lord is my shepherd. That's right. I shall not want because the Lord is my shepherd. No disrespect to those of us who stand in office, but ultimately I have found, this is no, I have found more comfort and guidance in my life from beginning to end from my heavenly shepherd. And I have found that God then uses earthly shepherds and others to assist in the process, but they are assistants. We call ourselves seniors. We even have the audacity to call ourselves bishops. The truth of the matter is, he is the bishop. The truth of the matter is, we are his humble servants. We are his assistants. Having said that, 
He said the sheep listened to his voice in verse 1, and through that whole passage, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And his sheep, in verse 4, follow him because they know his voice. There is this thing, when you first come to Jesus, there is kind of an excitement. This is why it's so important to be in the right church. Because those who are representing the voice of the shepherd have got to be pretty close they're not perfect either, but they've got to be. And that's why I feel it is always safer to stay close to the Word of God. We can make jokes, we can offer opinions, but as long as we stay close to God's Word, we will always be safe. Amen? And in that, we understand that you now, and I don't know about you, but you know, you first came in and someone said, you know, you need to go to Bible study Wednesday night, and you need to come to this, and you need to learn that, and you need to read your Bible. And so you start trying to read your Bible, you start trying to do all the right things. You are now a sheep, and you know, I've heard preachers talk about the sheep as being dumb. Let's be honest, they're not the highest IQ animal in the world, but it was intended to be that way when he used the analogy. Just like he wasn't insulting us when he called us children. What he was saying is that there's a stage, and if you don't master that stage, you will never move on. The stage is that you're not dumb. The stage is that you're smart enough to hear his voice and hear it through the preacher or through a scripture you read and commit yourself to following that. You have to learn sheephood, sheepness, sheeping. You have to learn how to be a good sheep. before you can move on. And so you follow the shepherd. Now, if the shepherd, who's an assistant to the shepherd, is following the true shepherd, you will always be so safe. Which is why that shepherd who's assisting is supposed to tell you, you need to learn how to read for yourself. You need to learn how to pray. Because if you're not connected to the senior, the big shepherd, there is risk in the little shepherd. And hats off to the, to the churches that do thrive and do do well because they do have shepherd pastors and leaders that are trying to hear from God. Hats off to them. And there are some wonderful ones. But the risk is there in leading you in a way that is too closely attached to human beings. And what role that shepherd plays is important and the sheep follow. And there's something good about that until the sheep stay dumb. They get dumb because that's all they do. They don't learn how to move to the next level of relationship in God. I rebuked the pastor. He's from this area. And at the time, we were behind the scenes. We were ready to go out and do an event. And I said something. This was years ago. I was a lot younger, so, you know, they surely knew more than I did. And he made this comment, well, about going out. He said, don't worry about it. They're just dumb sheep. I thought to myself, how could a man of God say that and go out there and act like you love people? So I got up in his face and said a few things there. And we had a little discussion, went out to that stage, acted all holy. I was mad at him the whole service. And because there is a twisting of this concept to either cause people to just lose their brains and only follow you, or to demean them, to elevate you. And I believe the healthy response is that I'm now learning which voice I need to hear. I was a sinner. Now I'm a child of God. But I must be born again and like a child follow my heavenly father, my shepherd, and learn how to progress healthy in that stage. If you're not there, folks, I really am. It's terrific to see your faces. I am a little concerned about the church today, and we're trying everything we can to reach you, okay? And sometimes we go so far in that process, I wonder if we're leading you or if you're leading us.
And we should all wonder if God is really in control or if culture is leading, trends are leading. But the bottom line is, we cannot say sheep forever. If all you do is come Sunday morning three times a month, with all due respect, you're probably a sheep. And I even question at some point whether or not you're the good sheep or the other sheep. The good sheep hear my voice, he said, which means you progress. Obviously, we're using metaphors and not literally we're talking about animals. We're talking about the metaphor of relationship with God. Unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's what he said. Well, what if you're 45 years old? Nicodemus, he's trying to help us understand a concept. And if you sit too long in that place of just, well, I go to this church or I go to that church, I just would, and you sit there, something happens, a dumbing down of the relationship between man and God begins to occur. That is a concern. Let's move on, though. Let's be positive and say there's more. There is more. The third thing, and by the way, 1 Peter 2.25 is another scripture you can read later. Servants is the next one. Luke 17, Luke 17, verse 10, he says, when you have done everything you were told to do, good sheep, hear my voice, you should say, we are unworthy servants, and we have only done our duty. Jesus said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. Think about that. If this son of the living God came to serve, who in the world am I? If all we do is come to be served, if I only come to a Sunday morning to hear a message, I am coming to be served, and I am dumbing down. My sheep status is now flawed, as opposed to being a progressing sheep who follows the shepherd's voice and becomes now a servant. Faith without works is dead. So we can say, I have the Christian faith, but I don't. In another faith, we won't mention the name, but you'll know what I'm talking about. The perversion of that faith produces death, killing, terrorism. What happens with the perversion of the Christian faith? What it does is it locks up the antidote that humanity needs in a vault that people cannot reach. Which one kills more? And as you become a servant of the Lord, you find that there's nothing lofty about it. What did he say? Listen. What did he say? When you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. We don't brag about going the speed limit to the state trooper. We do what we should be doing. When you've done all that you're supposed to do, so now you're not still messing around with tithing. You tithe. The first 10% is the Lord's, period. Now you contribute to the needs of the house. Now you pray because... When you want to pray, you want to make sure you have sown prayer so you can reap prayer, okay? You want to make sure you're part of things. You want to build family and fellowship and community, and you want to get involved in those areas and start to get involved with other people's lives. I was listening to a gentleman, multi-billionaire, and, oh, I think he was the founder of Home Depot, and he was, I love listening to these older folks talk because it's just, just so much, so much experience and wisdom comes from them, and And he was just talking about how, he says, all of the achievements, all of the building, all of the things that I have done, he says, and he said it with no pride whatsoever, just but just raw conviction. He said, doesn't come close to the good I want to do for the rest of my life with what has been given to me. 
Watching a child be able to go get education that's got potential. Why building a school where, where, where you can take it and, and, and really bring achievement out and where, where people said those kids are, are never going to make it. He says, that's what brings real joy. And it took me all these years. He says, I wish I knew this when I was 21. Folks, there is something about serving. And so we begin to learn that it starts right there in your home. It's not about signing up for a church ministry. It's about husbands helping their wives. It's about wives doing it without complaint, but serving that man that they love. It's about individuals, children, helping their parents and serving instead of waiting around for parents to do everything in the world for them with barely a thank you. Entitled and enabled to the point of almost complete weakness. They haven't learned to serve. And then they go to a job and the boss spots it coming in the door. You're not a servant. You want to be manager coming in the, uh, you know, from the street. And so he causes us to move into this place. You know, in Acts chapter 16, the apostles were, were, they were operating, and a demon cried out, and he said, Oh, look, these are servants of the Most High God. They should know us by our serving spirit. And I was a sinner, but now I am a child of God. And I was a sheep, but I learned how to listen. And now I am a servant, and I'm growing closer to him and growing closer in him. And from this, folks, it's endless. Because now in John chapter 15, John 15, I know I'm running you around a little bit, but you can catch up later on if you take the time to study. In verse 13, he says, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If it's not guaranteed because you are a Christian that you are a friend of God. You are friends if what? Tell me what. If you do what I command, you are no longer servants because a servant does not know his master's business. I'm losing it up here. Is that exciting or what? Help me out. Think about that. He's not putting down the servant stage any more than we should put down the sheep stage. We certainly aren't going to put down the sinner stage. We get excited when somebody gets saved. But what he is saying is, I'm elevating you. Don't forget always that we all still sin. Always still be that humble follower of the Christ. You've still got some sheep in you. Never stop serving. But I want to bring you closer to me. I want to call you my friend. you got to be kidding. Friend of God. Moses. A friend of God. Paul. God loved him so much, couldn't stand it. Had to snatch him up and bring him into his into his realm. So much, so much that can be said about that. But let me give you the full message here. You can ponder it yourself. John 12. He takes it to another level. And in this level, John 12, verse 36. And he begins the process here. I think Romans 8 is better. Let me tell you, he says this. Time short, I'm looking at that clock back there, it's dictating to me. Those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. He calls us sons at this point. He goes on 2 Corinthians, and I think I'm going to read 2 Corinthians because there's something else in there I want to throw out. 2 Corinthians, you know the scripture, many of you, some of you don't. Do not be yoked together with an unbeliever. 
For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever, no matter how cute she is? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be different, be separate. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons. And this is one of the few times you'll see in Scripture it includes women. All of them include women, but it doesn't always say that. It rarely says it because of the culture of the writing. You will be my sons and you will be my daughters. So now we are elevating not just friends. And in human terms, as precious as our friends are, they're not the same as our sons and daughters. Now we're starting to move closer to something called inheritance. The powerful concept of inheritance. God has so much more for us. And I'm going to Make the decision not to finish this and rush it because this is just, there's too much that we got to get here. There's more. What I want you to already see is that it's overlapping, but it's progressive. And the intention was that we would grow in Him. And so, in everything that's successful in this world, you will see growth process. From getting a black belt to planting a seed in the ground. You get a job, you don't think about just working that job. You think about progressing. It's built into our DNA. The kingdom in us is always advancing. I bless you, Genesis, he said, so that you can be fruitful, multiply. Fill the earth, subdue, and have dominion. It's always, the kingdom is always growing in us. Sometimes growth only looks like learning. Sometimes growth is repositioning. Sometimes growth is healing. Sometimes growth is obvious. I submit that the kind of growth in you that is obvious is the least frequent. That's why I don't want people judging me. You don't know what my father's doing. And we so often judge based on those things. You need to ask yourself already so far, where am I in my relationship with him? And it's my privilege as well as my job to tell you, he is saying, Come closer. I have more for you. Amen? Bow your heads, please. Would you stand? You've been sitting there long enough. And out of courtesy, when we do that and we stand, that's, that's a perfectly fine time if you do need to slip out, okay? Let's just take a moment here and let's pray. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you don't know. In other words, if someone walked up and said, who's Jesus to you? If you have no answer for that, my God, what place on earth is better than a church to make that commitment? And the reason why we don't go dragging people, we don't go trying, because quite frankly, you either want them or you don't. But if you do, two opportunities. Number one, you can leave and go home. And you can accept Jesus later on in your privacy, but you can also come down here where I have people praying and pray with someone. There's something about confessing it, something about sharing it that's powerful. But for all of us here today, let's examine where we are in this magnificent invitation that God has offered to us all. Amen. Oh God, church, can you see? Can you see why I don't get hung up on white and black? Can you see why I don't get hung up on Hispanic or this? Because those are baby talk. Baby talk in the kingdom. 
so much more, so much more. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you so much for your word. And I also thank you for your people. They, we encourage each other. And in that, Lord, life is lived richer and allows us the playground, the garden, to grow and to be fruitful and to cultivate and to build relationships, Lord, that are meaningful and lasting. I pray, Father, for my brothers and sisters here and for those who don't yet know you. I pray, Lord, those online that are watching, I pray, Father, and that's what I can do, Lord. I can preach and I can pray. Holy Spirit, they're all yours. Touch their hearts and their minds. In Jesus' name, we all said amen and amen. God bless you, church.